any education apart from Jesus Christ is for us miseducation. And it produces not education nor an educated man, but a new race of barbarians who are today busily destroying their civilization. Humanistic education is the institutionalized love of death. Christian education, because it serves him who says, I am the way, the truth, and the light, is the love of life. This is the Love of Life podcast, conversations with Jesse and Courtney. But whosoever looks in the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, he shall be blessed in his deed. And then in chapter 2, verse 8, it says, But if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, which says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. So it's interesting that there's sort of this dichotomy between law and liberty. In one sense, you would think, well, the law is a restraining force in a lot of ways. You wouldn't think there's liberty attached, and yet the two go hand in hand. So you have perfect law. It's the perfect law of liberty. It almost seems like it would be an oxymoron, but yet they're married to one another, and they really do go hand in hand. How so? Like obeying God's law. Yes. So obeying God's... true liberty. Exactly. So obeying God's law by doing what he commands, which his commandments, Jesus says, are not burdensome. That perfect law leads us into liberty. We have the liberty to do good by obeying the things that God commands us to. And if we look at God's commands, kind of like one of the conversations we've had lately, the law, breaking the law is not just arbitrary rules that God set up for us. You God, like the Ten Commandments specifically? Well, with all of the law, any shadow of, of turning from the law or breaking the law isn't just breaking a mere arbitrary rule because the God of the universe said, says, don't have fun. Or don't do this just because I told you. There is the, the reason why is because God is all goodness. God is all love in any shadow. So if I, if I, for instance, were married, obviously, if I were to cheat on you, I'm not showing love to you. I'm committing adultery, as an example. So when the when the law says you should not, you shall not commit adultery. We're, since we're, man is made in the image of God, we're, we're lying about that image inside of ourselves if we break the law. We're lying about who God is. God is saying, I'm perfect love. Within the triune Godhead is, is love. It's perfect. There is no shadow of turning, right? So as a result, Anything that we humans do in sin is a direct offense to God because it's directly offending his nature, which he has set up as the law. The law is don't offend my nature. Don't cheat. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't do all of these things. Why? Because God himself doesn't do those things. God himself is goodness. It's like how you put it to me the other day, which I feel like is maybe easier to understand. So I'm still trying to wrap my head around that is all of the law is a reflection of God's character. So when God says, thou shall not lie, do not lie, it's because he is truth. Right. Yeah, so, exactly. That's that's what I'm saying. Yeah. He's, that's what I just said. So all the all, God is goodness. <laughs> I said, used a different, well, no, I, I use, I use a different line. I say all God, God is goodness, but yes, God is truth. God is he, he's all of these attributes and these things that he declares of himself. And there's the law. In the law, my, my, I think my point is to say, you know, we look at the law sometimes as, as humans and say, okay, well, uh, you know, don't do this thing. Don't do, you know, this, this offense. And we forget what's behind the perfect law, the royal law, as James calls it. 
and that is the character and nature of God himself. God himself is all of those things. And when we break something that offends his goodness and his holiness, we're not, we are, of course, breaking the law, but we're offending the personhood of God himself. Yeah. Right? It's crazy. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I feel like when you told me that the other day, because it does just seem like, you know, okay, so God said, you know, do this and don't do this. Well, he could have said, don't do anything. You know, he could have made the Ten Commandments or, you know, all the law something different. Mm -hmm. These are just like things he just picked. So these are things that matter. And you're like, no, these yeah. these things are directly connected to his nature. We're not supposed to do these things. Or we are supposed to do these things because we're made in his image. And it's they're not just arbitrary laws. Right. They are specific to to show us what God is like. To show us what God is and like. And things and, him because of what he's like. Right. And how he made the world. He made the world a certain way. Uh, he made one man and one wife, not two men, to be together in matrimony. He made the world a certain way. And when we violate those commands, we're violating the way God set up the world, as was originally intended. And we're violating a, a part of, or should I say, a piece of his of his goodness and holiness, of his character itself. Which, you know, I mean, it's not as if God says, uh, you know, again, he's not arbitrary. He's not saying, oh, you know, don't do this because I don't want my, I don't want people to have fun. Mm -hmm. Don't wear blue hats. I don't like, I don't like the color blue, you know, or something ridiculous like that. Every one of his laws are good. Every one of his laws are complete justice. And like we're learning with um, Rush Dooney in some of the stuff with him, even the Old Testament commandments, which some of them, you'll have to recall precisely which one you thought was so interesting. It's kind of like you have a top law, you know, do not covet, do not steal, do not. It, but then the laws kind of trickle down into actual things. What was that one it's example like, that you like used? case study. So like right, case study throughout law. Leviticus, it's application of the law, which we can extract the principle of that. So like the oxen, don't muzzle the oxen as he treads out the grain, which right. actually in the New Testament, Paul explains that one for us. The principle to be extracted is that the laborer is worthy of his wages. And it's also connected by Paul to the fact that those who preach the gospel as they're, as they're living should reap the material benefits from the listeners. He's that pastor is sowing into the congregation. He's pouring out his life for the sake of the word, for the sake of the congregation. He's sowing spiritual things that, and then they should let him reap of material benefits. So why the tithe is important that that's, it's a part of that old Testament law. That's the, that's the application. Um, and Paul does that one for us, but there are lots of them that yeah, we're learning that lots of <laughs> lots of great people have already gone before and helped pull out those big pictures. Like all of them were so that we could see what it's what those laws are, how you apply them, and then they're important because they reflect um, truth. Yeah, and yeah, and this this case study stuff is the case law is new to us. I mean, we didn't really yeah. see. As we have, we, you know, we've read in the Old Testament, and we, we we see some of these things that, to us, because we're not Old Testament Jews, because we're not old, you know, because we didn't live in that era, we mm -hmm. we look at some of those things and go, really, that's arbitrary. But you know, not uh, muzzling the ox is what it's. What is the actual principle, or what is the law above that? I forget which one that was pointing to. It was pointing to one of the Ten oh, Commandments, right? So it's like right. it kind of like works its way up. I yeah, remember? Right. I don't. Remember, remember I don't recall which one which... that's connected to. But right. okay, so there's the one about um, if you're out hunting, like don't take, don't kill the mom uh, yeah. and the eggs. Like I guess if you're gonna eat either the bird. Or the eggs, just take one. Like, don't take both. Yeah. And then 
part of, and I don't even know where that's at in the Old Testament, but uh, I think it's Rush Dooney who applies that to um, honoring your father and your mother. Yes. And that, you know, the original hearers, whenever they were out hunting, that that guard, that law would be a reminder that honoring your father and your mother is important. So important that God wants you to honor across the board, you know, like to be able to see that in the every day that was in their face. So they would be remembered. They would be in remembrance of that truth. Yeah. So, yeah, look, we just scratched the surface. Like there's (laughs) so many books we need to read to understand really what that is. But I think the thing for me that's been so like, I've never thought about it like this before lately is how important God's law is. Yeah. Like, you know, we've been studying the Psalms and in Psalm one, it's like all about how my delight is in the law of the Lord. And David repeatedly says, I love your law. He rejoices in God's law. And, you know, I think somebody said that he was just talking about the Old Testament law. Like he didn't have any of the New Testament stuff. Like David was delighting in don't kill a mother chicken and her eggs. Like, (laughs) So to me, I'm like, wait, what? Right. <laughs> like, help me explain that. How do you just like rejoice and sing and like about that? So that's, I think, when you first made the connection for me, that it's because all the laws are reflective of God's character. So when David is delighting in God's law, it's because he's delighting in God. He's delighting in his very essence, his godness, his purity, his righteousness, all of his attributes, because they're on display right. within the law. Um, like the other thing is, so how important the law is, and we are absolutely not saved by the law. No one can keep the law perfectly. Um, and if you break the law in one point, you've broken all of the law. We absolutely are only saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ through faith by grace, but we are saved from lawlessness. Right. So we're saved totally by grace, totally because of Jesus's perfect life. Uh, and his death in our place and his resurrection, but we are saved to be able to obey the law. (laughs) And when we love God, we want to obey his commands. So, you know, uh, the road to sanctification is through the law. Right. Like as we are obeying the law and learning and being convicted by the Holy Spirit and going, oh, (laughs) this is what's right to do. And we're turning from what's what's wrong. It looks like obeying the law yeah that that sanctification that's Mm -hmm. happening in us is better and better obedience to the law if the law perfectly reflects god's character and we are supposed to imitate christ and be conformed to his image then we will look like law obeyers right (laughs) right look like people who keep god's law if you love me you will obey what i command jesus said and my commands are not burdensome yeah so the antinomianism of which is just heresy basically says, you know, the law, we're free from the law. We don't have to keep it. We're completely under grace. And it seems like the modern day church and a lot of believers, and I know even us included, it's not as if we personally disregarded the law or said, okay, well, you know, woohoo, you're free. But I, but more and more, especially in America, people don't seem to care or give heed that call themselves Christians but they don't seem to care about God's law. And a lot of them don't really know it. Well, I don't know that we're taught it that well. Right. (laughs) You know, or, yeah. I mean, I feel like so much of this is, obviously, like, you read the Bible and you know, like, okay, this is the way to live. You're supposed to do this. But put in these terms, I feel like this is very new. This is, and, like, viewing the Old Testament as just as important as the New Testament like something I think we've seen from Doug Wilson is that, um, you know, we, we view the Old Testament as second rate when it's not second rate. It's just as much God's word as the New Testament. And some of the, we might have known that and been like, well, yeah, of course. But like, there's two assumptions, he says, like you can either, um, everything that the Old Testament says, you can say it's not valid unless the New Testament makes a point to reiterate it so you can ignore it unless the new testament reaffirms it that's one view and then 
a more biblically faithful view is like that's the conclusion uh is that anything that's in the old testament stands unless the new testament fulfills it right so like we don't have to give animal sacrifices anymore because jesus was the perfect sacrifice but if the new testament doesn't say it's fulfilled therefore done away with then it's been completed um it still stands yeah so then it's like whoa you gotta read the bible all over again because there's a whole lot of stuff that we've <laughs> just skipped over or not given any heed to or not paid attention to like right, right. and there's so much in the bible like <laughs> you, we'll be learning for the rest of our lives oh yeah yeah and every person including myself and lately i've been saying this we're just scratching the surface we're just barely touching the infinite depths and the riches of the word mm -hmm. we're just barely we're, i mean and, and and we're reading a lot of it lately we're <laughs> we're talking about it a lot we're listening to it and it's like the the weird thing is and the cool thing is the more we ingest of it the more we realize how big it is how yeah. big and infinite the lord is of course but then even the the word that he's given us which is applicable all the time i mean there's so many scriptures we talk about this there's so many times where we're reading the word and we go i just think i just read this for the first time and yet <laughs> i've read this 30 times or 100 times or throughout yeah. my entire life yeah we see it afresh uh it's um what did you say last night it's um not that we see it with new eyes but it's oh, as if it's that it's living it's it's a living word that's yeah. that that's what you had said last night yeah yeah which that's how the word describes itself right. it's living and active right it is living it's alive <laughs> yeah yeah something that i'm doing different recently than what i've ever really done before like i've read the bible for years but kind of just more haphazardly like just you know i think of this scripture so i'm reading that and then, like, i kind of jump around or will like you know read smaller chunks or i don't even know how i've been doing it just i know that i'm very familiar with the bible and i've been reading it but like i've been doing the this bible reading challenge which is to go like through the summer you go through the new testament and then through like the school year you do the new testament again and the old testament which like i cannot wait to get to the old testament um especially in light of what we've been learning but it's it like just tells you like what to read every day and it'll be sometimes a whole book and then sometimes just a set of chapters in one book and then the next day you switch to another book and then it's kind of all over but what's so cool is i'm seeing connections between books that I wouldn't have before. And like, I'm reading probably about four chapters a day or so. So it's like, you don't have time to just like soak in on every little word, but it's like, you're just becoming fluent in the Bible and knowing, okay, like I want to read the Bible like this for the rest of my life. So I don't have to get everything from this, nor probably could I, but I'm going to read it again and I'm going to read it again and I'm going to read it again. And like more and more will sink in and you're getting that like big picture, I guess, of it. But like, I'm amazed at how many times that I'm like, oh my gosh, well, that same exact word was just used in Romans and now I'm in Ephesians. And like, I didn't, like the same theme is dealt with or Abraham is like all over the place in the New Testament. Just, I like when you're reading it that way, it stands out more, yeah. you know, which is just, I don't, it's so cool. It's like a different experience or even, okay. So what I was telling you last night that I was reading in James, it just had me read James one through five in June or July, I think July. And I read it again a couple of days ago and like something completely different stood out to me. Right. And was like, just hit me over the head with what? And that's yeah. another book that like I've read a lot. So yeah. it's just so cool about God. Yeah. And what he reveals to you in his word and like, I want to read as much of it as I can, as faithfully as I can, not because like I have to, but because it's like, what else, what else will he show me? Like you said, it's like a, a mine of treasure in there. Like, yeah. so that's been, it's been cool that it's been so different. So rich, like, yeah, yeah I look forward to what's it going to have me read tomorrow? Like where, where am I going to be reading at? Do you want me to read the thing in James? Yes, but I think we let's um, 
let's pause this and let's let that be a different episode because it's kind of a different topic. Okay. I think that would be good because this episode we're talking about uh, liberty, God's law. God's law, in conjunction with one another. <laughs> That's true, but this is how our conversations really are. Yeah. Like they're talking is, about one yeah. thing and they're talking about another thing, and then, right, and then it goes to the next and the next and the next, yeah. And then it circles around. Yeah. And some of these themes just get repeated because we're reading more stuff that adds to it. Right. But that's fine. Yeah, I think that's good. Do you have anything else to say about God's law, though? Oh, gosh. I mean, there's... There's... Yeah, I mean, there's just so much to say. Oh, about... okay. So say this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes? No, this is cool. And this is God's law. So, tithing. Yeah. And maybe we don't talk too much about that whole topic, but... Tithing is in the Bible. It is? <laughs> it's a command. <laughs> yes. But, again, it's another command that's not arbitrary. Right. And, like, God's so cool that he explains. We get to see sometimes why. Why something's a command. Yes. Like, it makes sense. When you do things God's way, it's best. It's best for the world. It's best for you. It's best. And it glorifies him. But God doesn't just say, here, do this, and then, like, leave it at that. Right. Like, he explains the why. Exactly. Exactly. And, okay, so the why. I don't think we touched on this yet. But the why in how we parent, for instance. We don't just lay down. And you told me this last <laughs> night when I was putting the kids to bed. And I'm like, go to bed. Darn. You know, <laughs> be quiet. And I came out of the room. And you're like, you really should tell them why. You should really tell them not just, you know, don't just give them the command, but tell them that when you're honoring you, me, you're honoring God. Mm -hmm. That there's that there's more that there, there's 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 a reason why they are supposed to obey. And of course they are just supposed to obey. They are supposed to listen to basic commands. Um but even the Lord gives us reasons as sometimes as to the why, you know, that it may be well with you. And that you live long in the land. Honor your father and mother, you know, for this is right. Um, this pleases the Lord. This pleases your mom and dad. This pleases, um, yeah, there's more, there's more to parenting and laying down the law than just giving the commands because I said so. At a certain point, a kid will be like, I don't care what you said. I don't care what you have to say. As, as they grow up, mm -hmm. we want to put in them a desire, a gospel inspired desire to listen to us, um, to, as David Vaughn has told us before, to get it into their bones. That is the word to get that understanding as well. This is why you obey your parents. This is, this is why you obey God. Um, so that it may be well with you. Right, or even like explaining, using a proverb, you know, like right. to apply to their situation. Exactly. If they're fighting or bickering, you know, like a kind word turns away wrath or like Proverbs is full of, this is what a wise man does. This is how, a, what a fool does. Yes. And like when you can show them that, when you can tell them God's law and that when they control themselves or when they are kind or when they don't just lash out or, you know, whatever the thing is, when you apply God's law, then they're realizing directly it's obeying or disobeying him. Yeah. It might be disobeying you first if they're not going to bed or not listening, but ultimately when they're obeying you, it is a way that they obey God. And when we love God, we do what he commands. Mm -hmm. So like you're even establishing that for them. And like what you were saying if that's not the ultimate end that we're teaching them to obey God and to love God, then if it's just do this because I said so, or do this because there will be this consequence, eventually you won't be there. Yeah. And like if their only motivation to obey is to avoid a consequence from dad or to, you know, cause my dad said when you're not around, that doesn't, that doesn't cross over. It doesn't continue but yeah. when they know I want to obey God because I love him and that's the best way. And when I disobey or I do something that's wrong, it's breaking his law. It's offensive to him. I'm grieving him. That's like a motivation that can last a lifetime. That's a motivation that 
goes it'll, beyond. Yeah, it'll stay. It'll stay with them. Yeah, yeah, and I really like that note. The the understanding of giving them a proverb that applies to their current situation. Mm-hmm. To say, you know, um, I don't know what example you use today. You use a particular. Oh, oh the boys were fighting in the back. Yeah, in the van. on the way to church. <laughs> on the way to church, the boys were fighting. One hit the other one, and you actually immediately had a proverb, <laughs> like ready in hand. You were ready to go. Yeah, it actually wasn't the one I was going for. The one I was going for, I couldn't remember. It still the worked. To. Well, I know it was like the <laughs> first one. I'm like, hey, this applies, and it was something about what the fool does and what the wise man does. And I kid you not, they were while well, you were there. They were yeah. quiet like the rest of the way, and yeah. it wasn't even like be quiet, but it was like. This is how a foolish person acts, and this is how a wise person acts. And they mm-hmm. both wanted to be wise. It's like, yeah. we're pulling into church, and Levi said, Mom, hey, they've been quiet, like, this whole time. I'm like, wow, <laughs> you're right. We have wise sons. Like, they chose the way of wisdom, uh, which is cool. But you were telling me on the way to church about back to the tithing thing. This is why it applies. We were saying that last night about the kids. Like, they need to know why, not just obey or else, or obey be- just because. But obey because it's pleasing to God. And here's even, you know, the principle and what it looks like, giving them that deeper meaning. Like some of the things the Lord's been showing you about tithing are not just here's the command, do it. Right. But like some of the reasons behind it, like we need that. Yeah. We, I mean, it, it should be enough just to say God said so. And on some level it is, but it helps our hearts really submit to it when we can see that this is why God says so. Yeah. And we like have some of the the greater good fleshed out. Yeah. So that's good. That's why I brought that up. All right. Well, I think episode two is coming in for a landing here. Land the plane. This is this is gonna be uh uh this is gonna be the end of episode two then. Cool. Thank you for listening to the Love of Life Podcast, Conversations with Jesse and Courtney. It is our duty through our schools to create a new one, a God-centered one. We are told in Proverbs 8, verses 35 and 36, For whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death.